Lithium is used as a long-term therapy for bipolar disorder that controls both the depression and mania that are associated with it. It can be bound to different salts, and these different lithium salts are also used to treat bipolar disorder, Since, but since lithium is the atom of interest in treating these disorders, I will focus more on lithium and only talk about carbonate when relevant. Lithium typically doesn't occur in free form in nature since it has high reactivity, so it is usually found as lithium carbonate or it can be found in water since it can interact with the water molecules. Lithium is administered orally and can come into contact with humans by many different ways as you can see listed here. The most common way people are exposed to toxic levels of lithium is by taking it orally as a therapeutic for bipolar disorder. Since lithium is administered orally, its site of absorption is at the gastrointestinal tract. Lithium is an alkali metal, therefore transport proteins that normally transport sodium or potassium can substitute in lithium, since it has the same charge, and transport into the cell. Lithium can sometimes displace calcium and uses transporters to get past the cell membrane as well. The only known transporter to transport lithium out of the cells is the sodium-sodium exchange protein, or since lithium is being exchanged, the sodium-lithium exchange protein. Since there is only one transporter out of the cell and several into the cells, lithium concentrations can build up in the cells. Lithium can also undergo reabsorption in the kidneys. It is excreted from the blood into the filtrate, but about 80% of the lithium that is excreted into the filtrate is then reabsorbed and is transported from the filtrate back into the kidneys using the same transporters as sodium. This diagram shows the types of transporters that lithium can and cannot use. The diagram is specific, specifically shows the cell in the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron but the same sodium transporters are pretty much found on all cells in the body. The transporters highlighted in yellow are sodium transporters that lithium can also use. Lithium can be substituted for sodium in sodium hydrogen exchange, sodium dependent co-transporters, and sodium sodium exchange for forming sodium lithium exchange. Lithium ions are distributed in total body water and are not bound to any blood proteins or need to be metabolized for circula circulation. They can enter erythrocytes in the blood via the sodium-sodium exchange, except it would be sodium-lithium exchange in this case. The erythrocytes can circulate lithium to different parts of the body as they themselves are circulated. Lithium is preferentially taken up by the cells of the kidneys, thyroid, and bone, but its therapeutic target is in the brain, therefore what lithium isn't absorbed elsewhere needs to cross the blood-brain barrier to get to the neurons. It does this by substituting in for sodium in sodium glucose co-transport. Lithium is not really metabolized at all, since it really is just an ion, but it can dissociate from its ligand in solution. So lithium carbonate does have a KSP, so it doesn't completely dissociate in solution, but it has a high KSP, which shows that it is able to dissociate. So when lithium is in its ionic form, it can use transporters for other cations to get into the cells. Excretion of lithium is delayed until about 24 hours after it is first administered and can last several days due to the slow transport of lithium out of the cells. So lithium is excreted in the urine and how it gets into the urine is it diffuses from the blood in the glomerulus into the filtrate of the Bowen's capsule of the nephron and is then reabsorbed using the same transports that transfer sodium, like the sodium hydrogen transporter. So only 20% of the lithium that originally diffused into the filtrate is excreted. The rest is reabsorbed by the kidney cells. And for people with kidney failure, lithium can be removed directly from the blood when it undergoes hemodialysis. Lithium ion is the effector and the parent toxin. The therapeutic concentrations of lithium in the blood 
are from 0.8 to 1.2 millimolar per liter, but mild toxic effects can be seen at concentrations around 1.5 to 2.5 millimolar per liter. Therefore, it has a narrow therapeutic range. Since lithium has a slow excretion rate and it can build up in the cells, this makes it easier for people taking lithium to experience mild and even more severe, severe toxic effects since they don't realize how long lithium can stay in the body and how narrow the therapeutic range is. There are several different organs that lithium can target in the human body. The therapeutic targets of lithium are the pituitary gland and the neurons. Effects of lithium in the pituitary gland can indirectly affect the thyroid based on the release of thyroid-stimulating hormone, or lithium can directly affect the thyroid by being absorbed by the thyroid. One of the major sites of lithium toxicity is the kidney. Without the kidneys, lithium can't be excreted unless the person is on hemodialysis. The kidneys also retain more lithium than most organs since it absorbs 80% or it reabsorbs 80% of lithium from filtrate. Now all that lithium can cause problems in the kidney cells. This can mess with tubular renal function which can then lead to renal glomerulus failure or kidney failure. The effect of lithium on renal failure has not been fully elucidated since there are typically confounding effects of diabetes and cardiovascular disease in the patient which can also cause renal failure. Cases of diabetes and cardiovascular disease are increased in people with bipolar disorder, so people who would typically take lithium, compared to the general population. Therefore, it is fairly common for someone who is on lithium and has renal failure to also have diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So tubular renal function is the ability to concentrate urine. It is typically reduced by 15% in patients experience lithium toxicity. Lithium causes this by inhibiting a G-protein coupled pathway that increases aquaporin channels in the, nef uh, in the nephron, which is activated by antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH or vasopressin. ADH is secreted by the pituitary gland, which is where the therapeutic target of lithium is. This is what normal tubular renal function looks like. Where water is reabsorbed from the filtrate, it is highlighted in blue. Water is reabsorbed in response to signals from ADH. This is how lithium can disrupt water reabsorption by reducing the number of aquaporins in the nephron. It can do this in two ways. The first mechanism that lithium can use to reduce aquaporin, or AQP2, abundance is it enters the interstitial cells of the renal medulla by an unknown entry pathway. It then causes the inactivation of glycogen th synthase kinase, or GSK. From this diagram, it looks like GSK, when active, causes the increased abundance of COX-2, but it is actually when GSK is inhibited, it causes the increase of COX-2. So COX-2 causes the increased production of prostaglan prostaglandins, or PGE2. Prostaglandins bind to receptors on the principal cells, which starts a signaling cascade leading to the degradation of aquaporins, the red phosphorylated channels highlighted in yellow, by lysosomes and a decline in urine concentrating ability. The second way lithium decreases aquaporins is by reducing aquaporin gene transcription. Lithium enters the principal cell by using epithelial sodium channels, ENAC. It then inhibits GSK, which downregulates aquaporin gene expression, leading to the decreased production of aquaporins. AVP, at the bottom left of the diagram, is another name for ADH, which is produced in the pituitary gland and stimulates the production of aquaporins. Therefore, lithium inhibits pathways activated by ADH. As already mentioned, lithium has been linked with causing kidney failure. It is known that lithium's impairment of the nephron function can lead to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, also known as NDI. 
Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is characterized by extreme thirst and the excretion of large amounts of very diluted urine. This is due to the decrease of aquaporins that lithium causes. To treat NDI, or most patients that come in with mild lithium toxic effects, is to give them lots of water with sodium chloride dissolved in it. If a person with mild lithium poisoning isn't treated, then the amount of lithium in body fluids can concentrate since there is a decrease in the volume of body fluid since a large amount is getting excreted. If the symptoms of NDI are not treated or lithium serum levels monitored in people who have been on lithium therapy for years, they can have a buildup of lithium accumulate in their kidneys, which can then contribute to kidney failure. Lithium can act as a therapeutic to treat bipolar disorder, since unlike most medications, it can counteract the manic and depressive moods that are characteristic of bipolar. It does this by interacting with glutamate receptors on neurons in the brain to keep the level of glutamate active in the synapse at a stable level. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter and it is believed that too much glutamate in the synapse can cause mania and too little causes depression. Lithium can concentrate in the pituitary gland which can then interfere with cell metabolism there. Lithium is also found to cause an exaggerated thyroid stimulating hormone response to thyrotropin releasing hormone. In the thyroid, lithium can inhibit thyroid hormone release. This is done by altering tubulin polymerization and inhibiting thyroid stimulating hormones effect on cyclic adenosine monophosphate. As you can see, lithium can have many different toxic effects on the human body, but the necessary role it plays in regulating neurotransmitters in people with bipolar disorder can outweigh the toxic effects of the drug.